All right, Christopher. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, please kindly note that right after Christopher is done, um, when it's your turn, you just, I mean, take, take the stage and then we just continue in that order, right? Thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Holtz Rogers, and I'm here to talk to you briefly about testing with WLCS, uh, the very aspirationally named Wayland Conformance Suite. So, briefly, why a conformance suite? Well, uh, we've recently, semi recently, like 10 years ago, started switching from X11 to Wayland on the desktop. Wayland is a protocol that's basically a set of promises that servers make to clients. Those are only valuable if the servers keep those promises. Uh, and in the Wayland world, there are a whole bunch of servers, and all of those servers need to make those promises and keep those promises. And so when we added a Wayland front end to Mir uh, several years ago, again now, we needed some way of checking whether we are keeping those promises. So WLCS was born. But not only Mir needs to keep those promises, every Wayland compositor needs to keep those promises. So when we developed it, it's not tied to Mir at all. The architecture of WLCS is your compositor provides a plugin that WLCS can load that plugin provides the various pieces of functionality that we need to test, start and stop the compositor, move windows around, click, whatever, see where, see where input comes from. Those are versioned, so if we ever need to uh, add new hooks, all of your existing um, plugins will still work, you just won't get any of the new tests. Um, so we have about a thousand tests at the moment in WLCS. Many of those are variations on a theme of these things with XDG shell, these things with XDG shell v6, these things with XDG shell v5, etc. Um, importantly, these tests run in the same process by default, which uh, makes it much easier to debug when things go wrong. If you have to debug a process tree, that's kind of awkward. If you have to debug just one process, you can attach GDB to it and step through both the test case and your code at the same time. So I'm just going to show a example test that we have here. Uh, for those who are familiar with it, like WLCS tests are just standard Google test fixtures. We've got a, yeah, we've got uh, the protocol under test. In this case, we're testing that when we specify a layer surface as zero size and nothing else, it's an error. We test it, we see the expected results. Um, and I picked this test for two reasons. One is uh, it's a negative test. This is a test of client failure behavior. And that's interesting because the failure cases are things that we often overlook. It's easy to work on just the happy cases. They're the bits where you get clients appearing on the screen and they work properly. Um, but you also need to make sure that when clients don't do the right thing, they get consistent behavior. It would be, uh, we really want to avoid the situation where uh, like, where an application developed on GNOME shell works there accidentally. And so you go over to KDE and the application suddenly crashes because it was doing something that it shouldn't have that GNOME shell accidentally allowed. Or vice versa, or Mir, or Sway, or WL Roots, or like all of the various different pieces. The other thing that is interesting in this test is you can see I don't know what I expect here. The protocol has not actually said exactly what I can expect. It said it's throwing a protocol error, hasn't said what. That's not a huge problem for Wayland because all protocol errors are, fail, are, are fatal 
and so this will just result in it being slightly more difficult to debug, but when you have other behavior, it's really helpful if the protocol actually says precisely what you do. And writing tests can make that much easier to discover these four laws. So go forth and test. If you are involved in a Wayland compositor project, try writing a plugin. If you're developing a Wayland protocol, write a test for it, or a whole bunch of tests, and submit them to WLCS or your own test suite, ideally WLCS. Thank you very much. All right, uh, this needs to go lower. Um, hi, I'm Savik. I'm actually on the same team that Chris is on, and uh, we work on Mir, and one of our products is Ubuntu Frame. And so this, uh, this will be about Ubuntu Frame and slightly more. Um, so Ubuntu Frame is a minimal display server uh, that is geared for um, kiosks, points of sale systems, digital signage, things like that. It has a small footprint. Um, it is secure. Only Wayland is supported um, with Ubuntu Frame. Um, you get one up per screen. So if you have multiple displays connected to, to the same uh, hardware, you can configure multiple applications um, to, or multiple, multiple surfaces from, the, from a single application um, to run on, on those. Um, there's static display configuration, so you can you can expect to have um, to have consistency in your display. We do support on-screen keyboards for cases where that's uh, that's something that you want, and we also support remote assistance. And because uh, live demos are great, but recorded pre-recorded live demos are even better. Uh, I'm going to do that now. Um, so. Snap install Ubuntu Frame um, and Mir Kiosk code. The Mir Kiosk code is our distribution of code that happens to, happens to work in, uh, in this situation. And so what I did here, yes, installing Ubuntu Frame, it takes a while. This was in a virtual machine, uh, which is why it's taking its sweet time. Uh, but just, just there almost, there's a lot of things that SnapD does behind, behind the scenes. So okay, uh, one thing, one extra thing here that we have a utility set up .sh that connects the required, uh, the required uh, interfaces for for Mirkas Kodi. And okay, so we run Ubuntu Frame. By default, Ubuntu Frame is just uh, you know a gray gray gradient background. Um, okay, so we have Frame. Um, that's kind of a simulation mode of Frame that it runs on your desktop. And well, let's run Mirkas Kodi. And uh, there's going to be a slight weird thing here in that uh, Kodi is actually going to run on your desktop, um, which is not exactly what we wanted here. We wanted it to go into, into frame. Um, and so enter Frameit. Frameit is a tiny utility uh, that, that we created for um, you know, simplifying um, your work to, towards Ubuntu Frame. Uh, frame is particularly um, geared to deployment on Ubuntu Core on devices in the field. Um, Snap, uh, Frameit is slightly you know, helping you out with, with the desktop side of things, with the development of snaps for Ubuntu Frame. Um, so after we install it, uh, it's a classic snap. Um, there's a, a couple of utilities, um, and if you just run frame it, Mercurius Kodi, or whatever else, um, you can just ask it to run any other application. Um, then uh, it will happen to work, and uh, it will put Kodi under your uh, under frame. It has another uh, another uh, nice property is that if you uh, if you use it as a uh, desktop session and this is what what we'll be doing here I um, in here I just change the session that uh, GDM will choose for for uh, for the code user uh, and changing the app that the frame it when run as a shell as a desktop shell uh, will use and now I will switch to the code user. Um, just checking a couple things like frame it dot check has a it will tell you if there's anything missing in your setup. Now it's all okay, and so now I can log out or switch users, and just just clicking on the Kodi uh, Kodi item in your GDM will take you to a Kodi uh, session on Ubuntu Frame, and that's kind of an instant uh, instant uh, media center uh, to be. Would be even better on Ubuntu Core, uh, but that's uh, that's a different uh, that's a different thing. Um, so we 
we run a workshop to making that happen. So if you have an app that you would like to uh, that you would like to put on Ubuntu Frame, uh, we're running it uh, on Wednesday 4 p.m. the last session of the of the of the summit just before the uh, closing plenary. Uh, you're welcome. We'll be packaging a Flutter app. If you have some other app that you would like us to to put put on Frame and and get help on that, uh, we'll be there. So thank you. Hello? Yeah. So I will talk about uh, saving, sa saving old printers, saving leg legacy printers under Windows with the help of WSL and printer applications. Any one of you, anyone, any one of you is running into the problem that Either you cannot convince your friends or family to switch to Linux, or you yourself are a developer for, for something with Windows, like uh, WSL, Azure, or something else for your day job with Windows, perhaps. And you have to use, and therefore, you have to deal with Windows, and you have to print out of Windows. And then it happens suddenly. So it happens suddenly that uh, with an update of Windows, your printer does not work anymore. You got into a new Windows version, and in this Windows version, Windows version, either Microsoft or the manufacturer is not uh, is not supporting uh, is not supporting window, uh, uh, this uh, this printer anymore, and so. You, 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 it seems for you, your printer is not usable anymore. You have to throw it away and you have to buy a new printer. This is not the case. We, we can help you. We can make this printer uh, uh, continue to work and so we can save it for, for, from the hungry trash bin and, we, and so we get sustainable. And the trick is, on the Linux, there we do not have this case that, uh, that, that an old printer driver will simply go away. We have very, very old printer drivers. I do open printing for 22 years, and every driver which existed there, which I packaged in that time, is still in Linux, is still in Debian Linux, is still in Ubuntu Linux, it's still all there. And even older drivers, before I started to work on printing, which were already there when I started, they are all still there. And so 30 more and more years old printer, even, even some printers which are older than Linux itself, are supported under Linux. And, and all these printers which are supported under Linux will also work under Windows with the method which I'm presenting here. And the trick is the following. We know we can run any, nearly any Linux application under Windows. As we have WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux. And, uh, and so, and the Windows subsystem for Linux, it does not only run Linux applications. The special trick is that it supports also Snaps. So the Snap Store is open for you under Windows. You can uh, use thousands of applications which are on the Snap Store un under Windows. And under them, there are also the printer applications. This is the new format for printer drivers. We, and I have converted all the, all the existing Linux printer drivers, which are free software, into printer applications and put them up in, in, in four printer applications on the Snap Store. And so these drivers continue to exist for all the future of Linux and also installable as a Snap under WSL.
And with this, as we can do that, your old printer is saved. And it is, it is easy. You only need what I am describing here. You need, you need, you need not, you do not need to compile anything. And you need Windows 11 or newer with the current WSL. You need naturally your printer. And the printer must work under Linux. Then we can make it work under Windows. And to do so, we have to do the following. At first, you have to check your printer. And to do that, you have to connect your printer to your Windows machine, either by USB or the network. And then you have to open the printer setup tool of Windows. It's nicely hidden. It's under Bluetooth and devices, printers and scanners. There you find the printer setup tool of Windows. And then you have to see, is your printer shown as already supported? If yes, you are done, then you don't need the trick which I'm presenting here. This printer still works under Windows. And if not, then you have to go on. So what we need is to install the printer application. At first, you need to install uh, Ubuntu Linux into WSL and switch WSL to System D. And for this, you take the Ubuntu application in the, in the App Store of Windows. In, and this is the Ubuntu Linux under WSL. And this you install at first. It's simply installing like an application. And if it is the current stable version from, this net, from the Windows Store, you, know, you must note that this, wor this version is not running systemd by default. You have to switch it to systemd. And for that, there is a Ubuntu block by Oliver Smith. You can see the link in, in, in the how-to which you find on open printing. Simply on the front page, you scroll down, you find some of the big icons and under, under this is written Windows. And, and this one you click and there's the how-to. You, you see all the information here. I give only a summary because it's a lightning talk. And now it's also uh, not much time. And so you switch it to system D. Then the next step is that you, if the printer is connected to USB, you have to, to install the USB bridge, USB IPD, so that the USB from Windows is forwarded into the, into the uh, WSL, so that the connected printer is connected to the printer application. Then, then you install the Avahai daemon so that the printer application inside the, the WSL can advertise itself to the Windows outside. And after that, you, you install the actual printer application. You install the actual printer application. And, and if you have done so, you install inside, you open the web interface of the printer application, localhost colon 8000, and there you set up the printer, add printer, enter printer, select printer model, and driver can select first detected printer, and then you, then you, fi then the, uh, the, drive, uh, the driver for it inside the printer application is usually auto selected. If not, you can also select manually. Once you have done it, you, uh, you go, you go to back to the printer setup tool of Windows, and there you will see, there you will see the, 
the, the printer automatically coming up is a printer supported under Windows and you can print under Windows. And here we have a video and you see how the printer prints under Windows. And here, here you see that's all working and the printout is coming out. Thank you. Here's the link to the, to the how-to, and I want to especially thank, uh, I want to especially thank uh, Craig from Microsoft. Please come all to the stage. Craig from, from Microsoft, Dani, who has, uh, who has, uh, So I'm Jonathan and this is Scarlett and we are from KDE and KDE is the original and best Linux on the desktop community and if you, if you disagree with that then you know we're the ones on the stage so yeah, live with it and at KDE we make uh, Plasma. Plasma is our Linux desktop, it's fast, it's lightweight, uh, it's simple by default, it's powerful when needed, uh, everyone should install that on their laptop. Uh, there's a mobile phone version, Plasma Mobile, so that can work on a number of, if you want li raw Linux, proper Linux on your phone, that does it. I've just had the pleasure of releasing Plasma 5.26 with Plasma Big Screen, so that's our edition for televisions. Um, and you can buy the Valve Steam Deck, play some games on it, get bored of the games, reboot it, and it's a Plasma desktop. So our software gets everywhere. We're, we make a load of applications as well. And we're a community, we're a bunch of hippies, we're, we're just doing this for fun, we just want to hang around, have a laugh. We met in Barcelona last month and, and it was beautiful and it was sunny. Um, and we made a load of applications, as I say, over the last 25 years we've been working on this. Um, but we're not very good at getting our applications out there into the real world, directly into the hands of the users. Um, that We've been kind of slow at doing that. So over the years, I've been trying to work out how to get our applications into the hands of users faster, more directly, more with the experience that uh, we want them to be and the maintainers releasing them on time. So I started a project called KDE Neon and that has continuous integration, continuous um, assurance, uh, quality assurance and then deployment of our release software so that our software can get into the hands of users. And this is for nerds, it's for the fanboys, it's for the developers, uh, it's for people who love our stuff. Um, but as we were doing KDE Neon, we realized, well, that's still quite limited because you still need to reinstall your operating system. This interesting new Snap stuff is coming along. Uh, so we started taking our KDE Neon technology, our automatic updaters. So we've got jobs that run every day to go, has there been a new release? And that can build our new packages for KDE Neon and it can build new Snaps as well. Scarlett. So, yes. Um. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, yeah. Um, with the snaps being built on the CI, I was uh, asked, said that, told that, that I couldn't possibly build all the KDE applications. I said, challenge accepted. So with the Neon tech, it is making it possible. Um, and so we have new snaps coming out daily. Um, and then I, I test them all and then I, I release them. Um, uh, there's still some. So, <laughs> yes, uh, we have over a hundred snaps released at this point. Uh, we are releasing 
new, <laughs> uh, I'm told we've had uh, over a million of installs of our SNAPs, which is spectacular, thank you. Um, <laughs> And our heavy hitters, of course, are Krita, our uh, uh, graphic design uh, art, very, very artsy uh, application. And uh, KDN Live, if you like to um, work with uh, videos and whatnot and make your own videos, it's, it's a number one software there. And Neo Chat, which if you like to chat with lots of people, it's matrix and, and IRC and all the fun stuff all in one neat package. Um, and, and I'm pushing out more and more snaps every day, so keep your eye out. Your favorite app is coming to you. <laughs> so we have talks coming up. Oh, we've got a long session on Wednesday uh, to talk about more about our technology and how it's done um, and the automated stuff and what still needs to be automated because we'd love to improve the the automated QA of our uh, builds. Uh, we also have talks coming out tomorrow from KDE people. Uh, what we do in KDE is being done by Alesh, and KDE Neon is being spoken about more by the beautiful Harold, and uh, Adrian will tell you um, about KDE frameworks, which is our add-ons to Qt for adding more features to your Qt-based applications. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We've got 16 seconds left. <laughs> then we can do a dance. We can, we've got a little time. All right. So we are going to talk about container images and a very new cool tool that we've been building at Canonical. Let me try to raise this up. Um, this talk could have been named how to get all of the advantages of a Linux distribution but without the size of a head. And uh, for a very long time until today, this has been one of the biggest criticism against the Ubuntu base image uh, that you might have known on uh, Docker Hub and other places, that it was way too big. Uh, and it has been such a strong statement that it has led to Alpine and BuzzyBox being the most used and the, the, the kind of developer's favorite on uh, Docker images. Uh, kind of defeating uh, Ubuntu there, which is a shame. So let's fight this. We have, oh, I went back. <laughs> All right. Um, building smaller images is just one best practice over all of the best practices. So why, why is this such a popular one? Well, I believe it's because it's one that is super easy to look at and compare with the other images. So if you have a look, like this is at scale, uh, respectively the compressed and the uncompressed sizes of the images. And uh, well, Ubuntu and Debian distro images are way bigger than uh, the Alpine and BuzzyBox and Google distro less of this world. So the choice is very easy from a developer perspective that has been told that the smaller the better. But even though it's a very easy property to look at, it might not be uh, so intuitive. Like it, it can sound intuitive that the smaller is better but do you actually know why that? And I'm actually asking you the question, so if you want to shout a few things. W why would you make your images smaller? Right, security is one. It's bandwidth, so okay. Efficiency, kind of performance, efficiency, security. Well, I think, yeah, security was originally the, the um, initial reason, uh, but it's always good to make things uh, smaller. But the, the originating thought was, the less there is in your image, the less there is for an attacker to, to exploit. So it's kind of a causality, but not so much. Um, and in, in fact, if we were to trace the number of vulnerabilities in an image as a function of its size, this would look something like that. I have another data point for you. That's the number of people who drowned in their swimming pool in the US, compared with the amount of power generated by the US nuclear power plants. So how does it relate with uh, the previous topic and curve? Well, exactly, that's the point. Correlation is not causation. And same as people don't necessarily draw in, in, they die in their swimming pools whenever there is more power generated by the nuclear power plants, uh, well, the smaller an image doesn't necessarily mean that it's a better quality or less vulnerabilities. And there are 48 outliers there. It's interesting to have a look at them to understand why and how. Uh, Ubuntu is one of them. 
And even though the, the size image has been one of the biggest criticisms, it's one of the well and best maintained images out there. So if you think about it, um, the, the best image, the most secure image you could be building is basically an empty image, right? With nothing in it, there's nothing to attack. It's the same thing as saying the best way to secure your servers is by turning them off. Um, but that's not very helpful or useful, and if you want to build something that is actually useful, well, you have to add some stuff on top. And that's what happened to some of these Alpine-based images out there, is that the end users added so much stuff on top of them from random places because it was not available from the distribution that they ended up having, well, first of all, big images, and second of, their, uh, of it, uh, insecure and unmaintainable. So all of this leads us to the following conclusion that, well, having a distribution might not be such a bad idea after all. But still, I'm going to skip a bit that. Uh, but that's, that's a few of the advantages that you get having a distribution on containers. Uh, but ha not having a distribution also has advantages. It's more efficient, it's maybe more performant, and it's still a good way to remove uh, attack surface or attack means that could be exploited for your images. So we are left with the situation where we have small images that are good because they are small, they are secure, they are efficient, but they are bad because they are hard to use and uh, well, in the end it's, it's uh, unmaintainable. And on the other hand, you have destroy images that are good because they are easy to use, they are easy to maintain, but they are bad because they are big with a big attack surface. So how do we do? Um, it kind of led us to ask, uh, ask the question, how do we build destroyless images that are still destroyful? So having the advantages of a distribution, but having the size and uh, the performance and efficiency of a distroless image. Um, it kind of rephrased this way, how to build Ubuntu distroless images. This is kind of a risky sentence. It has two outcomes. Either you build something that gets the, the best of both worlds, or they cancel each other out and we've lost everything. But asking these questions led us to actually invent or create a new concept that we've been uh, calling chiseled Ubuntu and uh, that is actually achieving the best of both worlds. So let me cover it and uh, try to have time for the demo part. All right, so chiseling Ubuntu as in removing all of the unnecessary parts in order to kind of sculpt the statue within the rock. Simplistically, if you look at a Linux distribution, that's a bunch of packages that are developed, tested together, and that have dependencies onto one another. Again, simplistically, if you look at the package inside of the package, you have a bunch of files, compiled binaries, uh, libraries that they are dependent on, documentation files, man pages, configurations, etc. And when creating a distroless image, usually what some what a developer would do, they, they would break these dependencies, they would remove some of these files, they would remove some of these libraries that are not useful to the specific use case that are, they are containerizing for. A hard sentence. <laughs> um, but this is a hard process. Well, you have to understand very well how packaging works, and you have to understand very well what the packages that you are breaking are doing. And this is also done every time within the definition of the image, rather than being done upstream by the image man by, by the packages maintainers. So with chiseling, we've introduced this concept of package slices that are a predefined set of files and dependencies at the package level. Uh, that is sort of a distribution within the distribution, but not really. It's more like supersetting the distribution so that you can build an infinite amount of distributions, sort of slices of the distribution that you are slicing. Uh, so for this, we, be we built Chisel that is able to chisel the Ubuntu distribution to build much smaller and much, much purpose built slices of the Ubuntu distribution, uh, starting with uh, the first one for .NET Runtime. And uh, you can actually already use it from within Docker files, uh, but this is basically usable from any kind of file system enabled uh, environment, because this is just a tool manipulating the upstream uh, packages, files and definitions, and installing it on your file system. So the second part of this talk was a five minute weight loss plan for your Ubuntu containers. Um, well, it's going to be a two minutes weight loss plan for your Ubuntu containers. <laughs> Uh, we're not going to use Docker files. If you missed the rock session earlier today, I invite you to watch the recording whenever it's out. Um, but we are going to use Rockcraft, a very short way to pitch it. It's sort of doing declarative approach to Docker file multi-stage builds. So you just have to declare what you want to include in your image, and the uh, multi-stage build happens uh, behind the scenes. And the first definition file that we have it is this one. 
I don't know if I can use the point to point here. Aha, I can. Um, so up there is just metadata information. Then you have what you could compare with the from part of a Docker file, but don't compare too much. It's just it is based on the 2204 Ubuntu 2204 environment uh, architecture. And what we're doing here is very simple. We are just building a part on top of uh, the base we called OpenSSL, and we are installing the OpenSSL package. So this is just doing a very simple install OpenSSL on top of Ubuntu um, exercise. I'm going to skip this one, but basically this was running the process using Rockcraft. You can find that there's a GitHub down there, so if you want to try it out yourself, you can. And what the outcome of that is a more than 120 megabytes image. This is what you would get if you would be building a Docker file with from Ubuntu 22.04 and installing the uh, OpenSSL on top. Then uh, I'm going to play the two difference, the difference game. Um, what has changed with the first version is just the base here. Suddenly we have no base anymore uh, and we are building on top of 22.04. This will be very classic for those of you who are doing multi-stage builds. Um, and once we've built that, we get an image with 50 megabytes uh, size that has the OpenSSL packages and dependencies only on top of no base. So this is what would, would happen without chiseled Ubuntu. Now if we do the chiseled Ubuntu part, this is uh, visible here because we are only installing the binaries. Then the output of that, and now you will get the title of the second part, is a 20 megabyte size <coughs> image. And as you see in the definition file, we are not much harder or difficult to understand or to read. Uh, just installing exactly what you need, which places us between DistroLess and Alpine with still the content of Ubuntu and easiness of Ubuntu. Thank you all. Uh, let's, let's, let's give ourselves a round of applause. <laughs> We've done so well. Um, all too soon, we've come to the end of um, day one. Thank you so much for being with us up till now. Um, just a few announcements. Um, we have a knitting session that starts at 8 p.m. in one of the breakout rooms. Um, if, you, if you can knit, please try and be there. If you can't, you, 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 you should definitely be there to also hang out with others. Um, also note that breakout rooms are opened for any other activities you may have. If you brought any board games you'd love to share with others, the breakout rooms are uh, available for you to use as well. So thank you all, and I hope you have a lovely evening. See you all um, tomorrow. Um, all the best. Bye.